stuff virtually. So I will give you some basic background information and more information about what we're doing for Bass in Georgia, and hopefully you'll learn a thing. Like Eamon said, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So hopefully my slides will go. Okay. So we have 16 different species of bats in Georgia. A lot of people are surprised that we have that diversity. It's pretty diverse for the Eastern United States. And in Georgia, all of our bats eat exclusively insects. So that's one of the things that not everyone realizes. There are bats around the world that are pollinators, but in Georgia, our bats are eating insects and they're doing a great job of it. And um, I know that you guys are talking about hidden connections. So one of the things that I want you to think about when I'm going through this presentation is our connections with bats and the kinds of things we have in common with them that you might not realize. Bats are a lot like us, they're mammals. They have fur, they're, they give birth to live young, and they're a really diverse group of mammals. There's over 1,300 species worldwide. And they're also like us in the way they're built. They're in the order Choroptera, which means hand wing, and you can see by this photo that their wing is basically a modified arm with really long finger bones. And those finger bones have skin between them that's very thin, and they're designed really well for flight. So the bat wing is just a modified arm. And it's, it's super cool and it's really efficient and we've definitely used it to try to mimic when we are trying to have things that take flight. So generally we group our bats into two different groups, the cave bats and tree bats. And in Georgia on the coast, you may not think you have many cave bats, but you actually have some species that we find in North Georgia in caves. And tree bats, we really say hardly ever use caves. They might be on the landscape around cave entrances during the fall, but they really are never going to use caves during their lives. So an example of a cave bat that's common in Georgia is the tricolored bat. This is the most common bat we have in caves. And as with most of the cave bats, these bats will use caves in the wintertime for hibernation, and then in the summertime, they'll be out on the landscape. And when I say out on the landscape, I mean they could be in like a tiny tree crevice, like the picture on the left, where uh, uh, more bats than you could imagine could fit in there, but maybe one bat would be in there or several. Or they could be in tree cavities, like holes that other animals have made, or as in the right, they may be in structures that are man-made. There are lots of different places that bats are found, but they're often under tree bark or in tree cracks and crevices. Now our tree bats that don't go into caves, these are a couple examples, and you can see right away from the photos that they're a lot more furry. So these bats have a different strategy for surviving the winter. They stay out on the landscape, and the red bat in the upper left is actually able to stay out on the landscape as far north as Missouri, and they can be under the snow and under the leaf litter. And the hoary bat is one example of a bat that can migrate really far. Most of our tree bats are migratory, and we know hoary bats can go all the way to South America to spend the winter. So they have different strategies for surviving. We weren't really sure what some of our bats were doing like red bats until we noticed when we were doing prescribed burning that we were um, seeing bats coming out from under the leaf litter in the winter time. And that's one of the ways we figured out what these bats do. And as I said, you know, they are migrating and we may have some bats in Georgia in the wintertime that came from Canada in the summer. We just don't know because it's hard to follow bats. They're really small and we can't attach big satellite tags to them. So we still have a lot of unknowns, but, but we definitely know they migrate. And a lot of people don't realize they use some of the same routes as our birds do. So one of the reasons I like to talk to people about bats is in general, bats are invisible. Right, you go outside and unless you're in a place where there's bats that are grouped together and you can see them right before it's completely dark, you may not even notice them. And you probably also know that bats use echolocation to travel, to find food, to communicate. And we cannot hear those echolocation calls mostly because they're too high frequency. And I have an example of a bat call. And so you can hear it's just a series of clicks. And these clicks get faster as they're getting closer to prey and they're basically using sonar. They're using it to find food and to avoid things when they're flying around. 
So we can't hear that out on the landscape, unlike birds, which you go outside, you'll see them flying around, you'll hear birds calling during the day. You may have bats flying right over your head at night and you have no idea. So another reason that I really want to talk to people about bats is in general, they have a bad reputation. Now this picture is supposed to be one that will make you feel a little warm and cuddly when you think about bats. And these bats are flying foxes. These are not native to the United States. They're the bats that look more like the mammals that we're used to hanging out with, like dogs and fox faces. But, you know, these kind of campaigns to make people appreciate bats are important because they do have a bad reputation for, for some reasons that we have to discuss. And the first thing that I want to mention is bats and disease because that's something that's on everyone's mind because of the current global pandemic. And, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the deal with bats and COVID-19? What do I need to know? How did this happen? So the main things to know are we really still don't know the origins of how this virus uh, first came out and we don't know what's responsible, but it is, there is evidence that it could be a bat that may have been what, where, the or, where the origin of the virus was, but we still don't know how it got into the human population and it probably wasn't directly from that animal to us. It did not originate in North American bats and you cannot catch COVID-19 from a bat. As I said, in general, when we are having viruses travel through mammals and get into human populations, there's kind of a, a middle animal and that can happen in weird situations, which is probably what happened here. One of the big questions people have is how do bats carry viruses and not get sick? And it's really interesting in bats, viruses kind of enter a long-term relationship with the host, which is maintained by the bat's unique super immune system. And this is something we're still learning more about, but it's one of the ways bats are able to survive the way they do. Bats can live over 30 years in the wild, even though they usually have one or two pups a year. They spend a lot of time saving energy and trying to keep themselves alive in, in ways that we can't do. But when bats get stressed in situations like where they are pulled together in wet markets, like you've probably seen some information about, when there are other diseases involved, things like climate change and habitat loss can also increase the, the chances that a virus will spill over into other species. And when a bat experiences stress of their immune system, that's when that virus balance might be disrupted and it will be allowed to multiply and spread. So, those are the ways that bats can carry viruses, but also spread them to other animals. One thing people always think about when they think about bats is histoplasmosis. And histoplasmosis is something that can grow on bat or bird droppings. It's actually fairly common in the Southeast because of all the chicken farms we have. And most people that are exposed to histoplasmosis don't know it and never get sick. But if you're in a situation like the bottom right, where you have a lot of guano and you have known histoplasmosis, it's very rare. That's a cave that uh, not very many people enter. You are, you are much more at risk than any other normal situation. If you're just around bat droppings outdoors, there shouldn't really be much of a risk at all unless you get really close and put your face in it. If you're in an enclosed space with droppings and you're cleaning them up, any droppings of any kind, you should always wear a mask and gloves just to be safe. But your chances of getting histoplasmosis are pretty low. People also associate bats with rabies. And like, like any other mammals, bats can get rabies. But we feel that it's likely that less than half of 1% of bats actually have rabies. And the, you know, there are lots of animals that can can be on the landscape with rabies and you're much more likely to come in contact with something like a raccoon or a dog. The biggest problem with bats and why they're they're the main cause of human rabies in the United States is that people can get them in their house and not realize they're there and pick them up, which if you had a rabid raccoon in your house you probably would notice that, but if it's a bat it might be something that goes unnoticed. Again, it's very rare. Human rabies cases in the U.S. are very rare, but it is a fatal disease, so it's something that we have to consider. So all bat researchers are vaccinated for rabies, and what we tell people generally about wildlife is don't pick them up. A bat on the ground is much more likely to be sick than one that's flying in the air, so it's best to just leave them alone. Another reason the bats get a bad reputation is because they do get into houses, and if you have a situation where you have bats flying around your living room, it's probably a problem you want to deal with. 
On the coast, we do have some areas where bats get into buildings in large numbers and can become a pretty big problem. Um, in reality, most of the nuisance bat situations are pretty small and can be handled by the landowner. And the most important thing, if you have bats in your house, is to first identify where they're getting in. The most common spot is your attic vent. These are supposed to be screened on the backside, but sometimes those screens fall off or are never put on. Also, places around your roof line can get damaged and cause spaces where bats can get into. So you need to keep up your, your structure to keep bats out. If you get bats in, we have a lot of information on our website at georgiawildlife.com, and I'll have a link at the end to the direct site for looking at our bat information. Um, the most common thing to use is an exclusion tube, like on the left, where you kind of seal up all the areas the bats are getting in except for one spot, so those bats can get out and then get, they cannot get back in again when they come back in the morning. Um, you can also use a one-way door uh, the most important thing to consider is that from April 1st to July 31st, those bats could have pups. And if you do a traditional exclusion, then you could trap those pups in your house and then you'll end up with a lot of dead bats and you'll have much more likelihood of those bats getting into your living space because they can't get out of your attic. So most situations can be dealt with by landowners, but we have a lot of information to help you and we have nuisance wildlife control operator information if, if you have a bigger problem that you need to have handled. But more and more, when people call me because they found bats in their attic, they want to figure out how to keep them around, but just get them out of their house, which is understandable. So they ask about providing some alternative housing. And the uh, bat house in the middle, which is called a bat condo, is probably a little overkill for most people. But the bat house on the left and the bottom right are standard maternity boxes that you can put up in your yard to provide housing for bats. Not all of our bats will use bat houses. It's mostly those bats that use caves during a portion of the year. There are lots of bats, and especially in the coastal areas, that love to use bat houses. So this can be a really uh, beneficial thing to do. The most important thing is that you put up the right type of bat house, Bat Conservation International. Um, they currently aren't certifying bat houses, but they approve designs for those bat houses to make sure they're correct. Um, it's important for them to get sun. Six to eight hours of morning sun is best, but especially in hotter areas like our coastal areas, afternoon shade can be beneficial. It's also better if you put them near good so that can fly out and get to cover quickly. They can find food and water and getting them 15 to 20 feet above the ground is, is important as well. So they have plenty of space to drop out without getting caught by predators. Now, bats are connected to us in many ways, and one of the big ways is that they're eating insects, and they're connected to us as a natural pest control in our country, and they provide a lot of pest control. One bat can eat half to almost their entire body weight in insects in a night, and a relatively small colony of bats can do a lot of damage to insect pests that, that do damage to our crops, like the corn earworm moth damage that's shown in this picture. It's been estimated that bats could be worth roughly $23 billion a year to the agriculture industry. It's a hard number to come up with, and this is a mid-range estimate, but we know that they are very valuable and they do directly impact our agricultural industry by pest control. The biggest reason that I like to talk to people about bats is because they are declining. And there are many different reasons for that. Like most of our species, the main reasons that animals decline is loss of habitat or changes to their habitat. Bats need clean water, they need big old trees, they need young trees, they need live trees and dead trees in different states of decay, they need clean caves, they need clear coastlines, all the things that we have lost a lot of in, in, in the past. And, you know, we are constantly trying to improve habitat, but you can't just go back immediately from all these losses. So bats have definitely suffered losses. And one of the examples that you can see really obviously is from the raffinesque figured bat that really prefers roosting in these big hollow tupelo and cypress trees, which our stronghold for those areas in Georgia is along the Altamaha River corridor. And there are not nearly as many of those trees left as there used to be. So this habitat is really limiting now and it has caused these bats to decline to the point that we feel that they're rare. 
Another newer thing that's affecting bats is wind energy. This is something that we weren't really sure how it was going to affect our bats. We expected it would affect birds, but it turns out that on one foggy night at a wind facility in West Virginia, hundreds of bats were found dead on the ground. And it's estimated that over 500,000 bats are killed annually across Canada and the United States. And that is a serious number of bats that, that is being killed every year. And it is also estimated that some relatively small changes to these wind facilities can reduce the loss of bats by a significant amount. So there's been a lot of work done to try to work with the industry to be sure that we can um, reduce the use of these wind turbines during low wind periods so the bats can actually fly without getting killed by wind facilities. So the main reason why bats are declining and that everyone's talking about is white nose syndrome. And if you haven't heard about white nose syndrome, um, I am surprised because there's been a lot of information about it in the last 10 years. White nose syndrome is, it was discovered it, over 10 years ago in New York and it is something that affects bats in the winter time. So it was first noticed because bats were flying out of caves in the winter time in New York, which is not common because there's no insects around in New York in the winter. And when researchers went into caves, they saw bats with white fuzzy noses on, and with fungus growing on their wings and ears. It took a while to figure out what it was, but now we know it's caused by a fungus called Pseudogenoascus destructans. This fungus is new to science, which is not that surprising because there's not a ton of people that study fungus. We know that it irritates the skin of bats and wakes them up from hibernation. It actually will eat holes in the wings of bats and cause damage. It causes the bats to die from starvation, mostly because they are waking up too often during hibernation. They also get dehydrated and they get infections in their wings. And this is the current distribution of white nose syndrome in the United States. It's spread very rapidly since it came onto our landscape. And in recent years, it's spread to the West Coast, through Canada further west, and it just keeps popping up everywhere in, during the winter in new states further west. You can see this year in Georgia, if you look at that map, it's moved a little further south. We found the first records of the fungus, not actually the syndrome, but the fungus in some of our culverts in the central part of the state where we have hibernating bats. So the impacts of white nose syndrome are very significant. In general, over 90% of the bats die in the first few years of infection. And this means millions of bats have died so far. That's caused a 93% decline in our regularly monitored caves across North Georgia since 2012. And it puts several species at risk of extinction, including the tricolor bat, which was always considered a pretty common bat in our state. This is an example of declines at the first site on state lands where we found the fungus. Um, you can see that we've had a 94% decline in just seven years at this site. And it is really, something that we're watching. We know that the numbers are starting to, to kind of bottom out, but does that mean that these bats are surviving? And what are we doing to find a cure? Well, you may have heard some information about a bacteria that we're using that inhibits the growth of the fungus that causes the white nose syndrome. And this is a researcher from Kennesaw State University. This fungus was naturally harvested from soil bacteria as well as bacteria that grow on wild Bolivian pineapples. And it causes, it releases a volatile compound that will reduce the growth of the fungus and in some cases completely inhibit the growth. So there, the researchers have found a way to distribute this volatile compound throughout hibernacula. And it's, it's not, it's definitely not killed the bats in the hibernacula, so that's been good. We've been using it at a tunnel site, so it's not a natural cave. But is it going to cure this disease? And the answer is no. When you're thinking about treating bats on our landscape, it's impossible. This is just one example of a cave system where we could have bats anywhere. For one, you don't want to inhibit the growth of fungus in caves that are not um, causing negative impacts and our native fungus because that's really important. And being able to treat all the areas in the airspace in a cave is almost impossible. So this could be a way to treat bats at certain sites to prevent certain um, species from being lost completely or protecting individual sites, but it's not a cure. 
So in Georgia, we are working with people treating uh, sites, but we're also doing a lot of other work to collect information. When the disease, the outbreak first started, we were collecting swabs and trying to determine how this fungus was actually killing bats. And now we're continuing to monitor sites and figure out how our bats are surviving in Georgia. We're also looking at places where we didn't know we had bats before. And, that, and I mentioned that we have found white nose syndrome. We've actually not found the syndrome. We found the fungus that causes white nose syndrome in culverts because when we started to look in culverts, we realized a lot more culverts had bats than we expected. And we are mostly finding them in the winter time when that's the important time when they could be affected by the fungus in the southern part of the state. So we know these tricolored bats can't get to caves outside of the north part of the state and the southwest part where we have more cave systems. So they're using these culverts as temporary hibernation spots to protect them during cold periods. And so we're trying to find out more about how they use those culverts in the winter time, but we also need to continue to monitor bats in the summer. So we have set up some long-term misnetting sites in the summertime, we catch bats in, in similar ways that you catch birds. You put up a net that's really fine mesh and it's hard to detect. And in the case with bats, we try to find a place where we think they're going to be. Um, the, le the bottom left is the swimming pool over little St. Simon's Island. Um, it's not exactly a normal netting spot, but it, it, we catch a lot of bats on little St. Simon's at that swimming pool. Most of our sites are more like the picture on the right. That's a gator hole on Asaba. And, um, we definitely were trying not to go into that, but we were catching bats on the edge and got a lot of bats because there wasn't a lot of fresh water available that year. So we target these areas where we think bats are going to be foraging and try to catch them so that we can determine what species are in an area, what condition they are, and how they're being affected in the summertime. And so when we look at these numbers and what we're seeing in the summer and compare them to what we're seeing in the winter, we find that these trends continue. It's not just that those specific caves we're seeing are declining. We're seeing a loss of some of those species on the landscape. And this can be seen in particular with the northern long-eared bat, which is the one that's circled right now. Um, that species has declined so much that it's now threatened um, federally because of the, of the impacts from white nose syndrome. And then the tricolor bat, which I've mentioned a lot, our numbers have gone way down for them in the summertime in the northern part of the state. And, and we know that they have been really heavily affected in our state as well. And they're currently being considered for listing by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So another thing that we do for bats is acoustic monitoring. And I mentioned that you can't really hear bat calls, but we can use bat detectors to listen to the calls. The bat detector will record the call and reduce the frequency so we can hear it. Um, and it will give us a sonogram like the one that is on the, on the screen for the big brown bat. Um, and it will also record those calls. And so we can use some software to try to identify those bats by species. So it's another way to be able to monitor bats. And this is really important because it's hands off. So we can put these bat detectors on trees. We also put them on the tops of cars and drive mobile routes and monitor those bats without actually having to catch them. Now it's not easy to identify bat calls. So this isn't a perfect system, but it really does help us to find out more about our trends. And we actually use acoustic volunteers to run these routes. This is a volunteer that's been helping us for a long time. And um, we have a lot of routes on the coast and a lot of volunteers that have helped for a long time. So we have been looking at 37 sites across the state from 2009 to 2018. We're still working on this project and we've expanded another project, but this data is just from that time period. And we collected over 300 nights of data and identified over 10,000 bat calls. There were plenty more calls that we couldn't identify, but that's what we were able to identify. And we are just trying to look at some general trends from this work. And we have seen that the number of tricolored bats significantly differed between our northern and southern rounds, basically the areas that were affected by white nose syndrome and those that were not. And you can see clearly as time goes on, the bat calls from the north for tricolored bats go way down. And it's just another way, this is our third way to verify that the declines we've seen in caves are actually um, declines that are we're seeing across the seasons on the landscape as well. 
So to get back to your hidden connections uh, topic, one of the things that I always like to tell people is that one of the ways you can help bats is to plant native species. And that's not just for bats. And I'm sure Eamon talks about this all the time and you guys have heard a lot about it, but planting native species is really important for all of our wildlife. And for bats in particular, if you have native plants that attract native insects, those bats are going to be able to feed better in your yard and in your area. And they'll also have more cover where they can spend their time in the daytime. So planting native plants that the bats are used to is very important. And we actually developed a list with the State Botanical Garden of Georgia for native plants that might attract bats. This might be because they attract bat food or because that plant blooms at night or it's got a light colored bloom. So we try to come up with a list and it's not just these plants. We encourage people to plant plants for pollinators in the same gardens as plants for bats. Um, don't worry, bats don't eat butterflies. In general, butterflies are active during the day, bats are active at night. They're gonna go more after those moths and beetles and some of the other insects that are out at night. So providing habitat for bats and for other wildlife in your yard can be really important for you to be able to help them. Um, I have a bat house in my garden and I got bats this year and I can tell you, I mean, you would think that I would be tired of looking at bats because I work with them all the time, but we go out almost every night and watch them come out. Um, other people like to come over and getting your whole family involved in trying to keep up your native plant garden and provide more habitat for wildlife is something that you can do when you're stuck at home during the pandemic. And if you get enough bats in your bat house that you want to count them for us in the summertime, we have a little application on our website where you can do that so we can monitor some of these smaller colonies across the state. Another thing you can do for bats is to educate other people about why they're important. You know, we've done a lot of education events and I do programs as much as I can, but I can only reach a small number of people. But I know that people are constantly telling people about stuff that they've heard about. And if you share information about what you know about bats and why people should be concerned about them and why, you know, you should protect them, even if they're in your house, you can try to get them out safely without hurting them. It's really important information. And I'm sure you guys have seen this, especially since there's a new license plate with pollinator on it, but these license plates support our wildlife conservation program. We don't get all the state appropriations that come to the game and fish uh, sections of DNR. So we have to raise money in different ways. So if you wanna support bats and, and wildlife in Georgia, buying a license plate is a great way to do that. And also buying a hunting or fishing license can be really beneficial to all of us. So even if you aren't necessarily a hunter or fisherman, there's a lot of money that goes to benefit uh, wildlife habitat and our program as well through these uh, funds. So that's all that I have. Um, I wanted to leave you with this website so you guys could go and check out more of the information that we have on there. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Trina. Um, so again, everyone's muted. So if you do have questions, um, please type them in the chat box. We'll give you a few seconds to do that. Um, if I don't see any, we will just close out the talk. Um, and there's a few things um, mentioned and I'll try to do a follow-up email with some of these links and post a few things on our website linking to the species list and some of the other things. Okay, so we have a first um, question from Ashley. Have there, be, have, have there been any successfully tagged bats? Yeah, there have. So um, there's a couple of ways that we tag bats. We can put bands on them. You guys have probably seen birds with bands. Uh, they've been banded for a long time. Uh, there, the type of bands you use on birds aren't really good for bats because they don't really have much of an ankle. Their wing connects so close to their foot that there's not really enough space to put a band on their ankle. So we put them on the right below the wrist so that band is not the same as a complete circle that goes on a bird's leg. It's just a metal band with lips that goes against the wing membrane of the bat. So we can tag bats that way. We have had a lot of success recapturing bats in places where 
we know they come back. Like we see bats every year in the same culvert. So we're able to tag them. And sometimes we can see them moving between culverts. We also can follow them with radio transmitters, but we can't use big satellite transmitters or transmitters that last a long time. So generally our transmitters last a maximum of three weeks. Um, you're lucky if you get three weeks and um, they're hard to apply to bats. So we generally trim the fur off of the back and use skin bond to bond the transmitter to the skin of the bat like you would use in surgery. Then as that fur grows out, the transmitter falls off. So the transmitters have a very small range as well. We're lucky to get a, a quarter of a mile, a half mile out of that. Uh, transmitters, so it's a lot harder to follow bats than some of the bigger animals, but we are able to successfully tag and follow them, and that's been a way where we've seen some some migratory patterns, especially with some bats from the Midwest to the South, so we've learned a little bit, but not as much as we, we can once the battery technology gets a little better. Okay, we've got quite a few more questions. Can you see the chat, Trina? Do you want me to read them off, or do you want to scroll through them yourself? Uh, let me see if I can pull up the chat. Okay. So we got I athletes. can see. Next one was Brittany's. Okay. What's the most threatened species of bat in Georgia and where are they primarily located? So that would probably be the Indiana bat. Um, they are located in the northern part of the state. They've been federally endangered for quite a while. And uh, for a lot of the reasons that I mentioned, they are caved obligate species in the winter. So they've been really impacted by uh, impacts of caves and they have really specific requirements for their uh, summer roost sites. So they like uh, to be under loose bark under trees that get a lot of sun exposure. Um, so they've declined significantly, but I'll say in Georgia, we never had that many Indiana bats because we're on the edge of the range. So the bat that we've lost the most of in our state is probably the northern long-eared bat, which I mentioned, that's now federally threatened because of white nose syndrome. And northern long-eared bats are only known from North Georgia. However, they are known from the coast in North Carolina and South Carolina, that's relatively new. So we may have some remnant populations on our coast. We have done some work, but we haven't caught any yet. So that could be a population that actually doesn't hibernate that might do okay. It'll be much smaller than it used to be, but, but that's, that's probably the bat that's most threatened in Georgia, and that's directly because of white nose syndrome. Um, okay, another question, how long do bats live? So as I mentioned, bats are more like us than some other small mammals. So a small mammal like a mouse is lucky to live a year, but bats can live over 30 years in the wild. Um, there have been bats over 40 years found before. And so like us, they live longer and they have a lot fewer young. Most vets have one pup a year, some have two, and they have relatively high mortality. So um, their populations do not grow quickly. Um, this question, uh, can a bat house be installed 15 to 20 feet up in a tree rather than freestanding? So that's a good question. A bat house can be put on a tree as long as that tree doesn't have a lot of branches that block sunlight from it. So you, I'm not saying you won't get any bats if you put a bat house on a tree that gets a lot of shade. You might get some, but when you put up a bat house, you should be putting it up with the idea that you want to attract a maternity colony of bats. So that will give you a better setting for your bat house. So if you have like a big pine tree, for instance, that doesn't have a lot of limbs blocking the sun, especially morning sun, then you can put it up if you can get it up pretty high. The, the issues with putting bats on trees are that the bark is easier for like snakes to climb up and get to the colony. So if you have a problem with snakes, you may have to put a, like a predator protector on the tree, but, but you certainly can if you can get enough sun exposure, we've had successful colonies on trees. And actually bat houses on buildings do better than those on freestanding poles because they're more thermally stable. It's just that you're going to get a lot of guano on the side of the building and underneath, so a lot of people don't like to put them on buildings. But if you have a barn that gets good sun, that can be a really good option. Okay, so another question, does exterior lighting affect bats at night? Yeah, that's a good question. So you've probably at some point in your life seen bats foraging around lights for insects. And we know that can be a place where they will go to hunt, especially in urban areas. 
And most likely for those urban bats that are used to a lot of lighting, that kind of street lighting is not a big issue, but ex excessive exterior lighting is probably not good for bats because they can be flying along and those floodlights could really like flash in their face and that could cause them to crash into buildings and trees and things. Um, because they aren't just using echolocation, they're using sight as well when they're flying around. So I would say exterior lighting, you know, like street lights is probably not terrible, but as with all wildlife, if you can reduce exterior lighting at night, it's a good thing. Um, so a uh, question to repeat the species of bats that are federally listed are being considered. So the gray bat, Indiana bat were federally listed before white nose syndrome. The northern long-eared bat has been listed since white nose syndrome. And currently the tricolored bat and the little brown bat are being considered for listing because of impacts from white nose syndrome. Okay. So uh, someone asked, that the, the, they said they installed a bat house seven months ago and they've been putting guano around the area of the tree, but they still don't have any bats, even though they see them flying around. So um, I would say go to our website and look at all the tips we have and see if your bat house is in the best spot. I will also say seven months is not that long. You know, uh, bats will sometimes take some time. The bat house will age and it won't have as much of an unusual smell over time. So it may take a while for bats to use it. If you see bats in the area, you may be seeing bats that won't use those types of structures. Like uh, you guys on the coast have a lot of seminal bats and red bats and bats that don't use bat houses. But it may also be that they just already have a roost site that's really beneficial and that they're doing really well. So they don't need to move. I'll also say that this is the time of year where you might start to see bats checking out new roosts because their maternity colonies have broken up. Um, our bats just came back. It was, they were not in the house during the summertime, but they just came back um, to spend the cooler months in, in my bat house. So they may pop in and out. And sometimes it can take years before bats find your house. But I would say if you have a house up for a couple of years and you don't get any bats, it might be a good idea to reevaluate Make sure you still have a, a well-designed bat house. Uh, make sure the color is right, and then maybe try to move it somewhere else where it might be in a better spot for bats. Um, I have a question, has COVID affected funding for your organization? Um, so, and, and this person mentioned that we have restricted uh, wildlife rehabilitation for bats. So I wouldn't say that COVID has directly affected funding for our organization at this point. We, uh, we operate mostly on grants that were in place before the pandemic started. So currently we're kind of operating as usual with funding. New grants have been a little slow because not as many people have been working on the paperwork. So that has slowed things down, but hasn't really stopped our funding. Um, we, we did in the beginning of the pandemic issue restrictions on uh, rehabilitation because the biggest concern was we know that those bats, that our bats cannot give us COVID because it did not originate in North America and our bats are not likely to carry this type of coronavirus, if any. Uh, but we were concerned that it was possible that people could transfer COVID to bats. And some research that was done really quickly showed that it was a possibility so we uh, encouraged wildlife rehabilitators not to take in bats this year just to be safe because we can't control every situation and whether certain rehabilitators have people coming in. So we were a little bit concerned about that because of a bats released onto the landscape and we had transferred COVID-19 to that bat, it could transfer through populations and cause whole different problems. And again, that's really unlikely, but as researchers and people rehabilitating animals, we don't want to bring new problems into our wildlife populations, especially with bats, since they're already dealing with white nose syndrome and all the other things that are causing declines. All right, I think that's all yeah. the questions. Um, again, we will we are recording this, and so it'll be posted on our website, and we're going to start a YouTube channel, um, and so that'll have our videos on that as well. Um, so you can revisit this, uh, look at some of the content if you didn't remember everything. Um, but Trina, I want to thank you again for taking your time and everyone for joining us. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. All right. See y'all. See y'all in the next one.